on today's episode of The Journey. We're actually going to take a step back from the dog training part of it, and we're going to talk about more about the self-involvement that we have with um, the hunting community, the public, landowners, and ourselves. And, you know, when I was taking some college classes, I had to do a... Um, a PowerPoint on personal development and I still actually teach off of that PowerPoint today in some of the leadership classes that we have in our department and it's always about growth if you're not growing you're not making yourself better or the people around you better and when you put get put in a leadership position it's very important that you're continuously learning to better yourself for the people that's around you. So today we're just gonna talk about our interactions with each other, um, with with the community, with other hunters. And if we make ourselves better, then we can make our hounds better. And that's the whole purpose of the journey. I was watching um, The Bone Collector, uh, Michael Waddell, here a while back, and he was hunting with the guy that owns the franchise, Jimmy John's. And Michael had a, another hunter with him, and I don't recall his name, but Michael made a very good statement at the beginning of this uh, episode. And he said that, you know, in life, you're always learning. Life is a journey. You can put yourself around successful people um, that are in the, the, the business of, magnify, of using a magnifying glass to focus on becoming better at their craft. And they're humble enough to know that they don't know it all and they continue to learn. And that is a exciting place to be. And when Michael said that, it kind of really hit home that, you know, you've heard me talk on on the podcast about ABL. That's on my my office door, always be learning. You know, always be setting yourself up to make yourself more successful. And along the way, it brings everybody around you and makes them more successful. And that, that is our goal. And that's the goal with the journey is to make our hounds better, ourselves better, and the overall experience better. So today, I have two co-hosts riding with me. And the first one is none other than the man himself, Chris Powell. How's things up in the, the northern part today? <laughs> it's good, man. It's raining. We're getting that hurricane fallout. The November hurricane uh, blow by is coming through here. I think we're about out of the woods on that. It's going to be a good night to hunt. We finally got some. It's been dry. Wow, it's been the woods have been dry, and uh, this rain will help that. And uh, yeah, I'm excited to talk today about about what we're going to talk about because as I travel around the country and and talk to houndsmen everywhere. Um, there's just one common theme and we'll get to that in a minute but the thing that really inspired me to uh, to talk to Heath about doing this episode and um, featuring it on the journey is because that's our theme of this whole show is is treat, teach train and learn Heath came up with that it's a great philosophy and uh, but Shannon Raska posted something and made me want to go hunt with him and I got the opportunity to do it but the the post he made was work on the dog and the dog gets better work on yourself and all the dogs get better and as I listened to that and I internalized it I thought man this guy's this guy's thinking a little deeper than you know how the next race is going to go and 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 things like that and and it just excited me and uh and we've recruited somebody to be here with us and uh you want me to introduce him go ahead yeah we got we got uh, Paul Frederick with us. Paul, I'm glad that you agreed to sit in with us today and help us uh, lay this out and just have a general discussion about self-growth and, and how we as hunters can be better uh, when we focus on making ourselves better, how our hunting, hunting experience is better. Paul, how many years do you work with UKC? Well, I was with UKC from October of 2012 until, um, I think, June of 2014. So yeah. uh, not quite two years. Uh, of course, been involved with, with coon hounds and coon dogs 
a long time before that and since then. Um, but yeah, just right at a little less well, you than two were, years. At, you know, you were a big part of that, the most iconic <laughs> club in the United States, I would say, Coon Hound Club. Coon Hunting Club, and that's that Flora Club. Everybody knows where Flora is. Oh, sure. Were, yeah, everybody, everybody's everybody been there. And I, yeah. I think uh, uh, I was born and raised in Flora, um, Illinois, live in Indiana now. But my dad became president of the Flora Club when I, I, I think it's about 92. So I'd have been like 92, 93. I'd been like eight, nine years old. So, And we were very involved before that. But, uh, man, if you just go and, and – he had stepped down a couple times, but he's president again now. But if you just go back to 92 or 93 and list the big hunts that have been in Flora or Salem, which, uh, of course, they have to – they help uh, satellite cast from Salem. Also, whatever hunts are in Alney or some of these other places, if they've either hosted at Flora or helped other club host, it's it's um, phenomenal, really, when you, when you go back and look at that list. One of – one of the most impressive events I've ever been to was black and tan days. The first one I ever went to was in, was in Florida, Illinois. And, um, um, it was amazing when you got there, the, I mean, it was an event. It wasn't just a coon hound event. Mm -hmm. It was an event. And I don't think I got there until Thursday and people were like, Man, you're late to the party. We've been here since Sunday, you know. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it, Floor has always been that that type of an iconic club for sure. And that's that's oh, why yeah. I wanted to. And now you're a uh, you're pastor in a church. Yes, sir. In yeah. Laurel, Indiana. So we know you're not afraid to talk. No, sir. <laughs> not usually. Anyway. <laughs> so yeah. welcome, Paul. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to be here with you guys. Yeah. I think there's just a lot of things we can talk about on this one, and I'll give it back over to you here in a minute, Heath. But, uh, um, you know, the, with with the credentials that you've got, Paul, you've worked in the people business your whole life, and yeah, that's what we're well. really talk. What that's what we're really talking about here. We're talking about people business and and how our journey can be so much better. I mean, if, you, if you're just looking on the, at the destination you're headed, you're going to miss so much along the way. You've got to mm -hmm. focus on the journey. You've got to focus on things that help you around you. Because if all you're looking at at the destination, man, you can get there fast or you can enjoy the walk. You've got to enjoy the walk. Absolutely. Yep. Very true. Well, Heath, you want to take back over or you want me to roll with it? It doesn't matter. I think we're both going in the same direction, so... Just yeah, we are. Go with what we have. <clears throat> so as hunters, um, and like I said, we're kind of leaving the the training the training part out of it today. You know, as hunters, you know, we sit back and we look at ourselves. Um, I, I constantly. Um, let's let's not take the training part out of it. Yeah. Well, we're what training I, ourselves. As a master, uh, yeah. As a master trainer, though, if you go into a training <clears> session. <throat> And you're frustrated. You're angry. You're you're internalizing a bunch of stuff. How does that training session in the police dog world, and this can transfer over to coon hounds as well. It, it, you might as well just step away from it because it's going to be a train wreck. Um, uh, in fact, we we I was having a conversation. We have a new dog that we just got, and we're starting to imprint him. And I was talking to the new handler yesterday, you know, and I said, you know, this is a process, and my goal with you is to produce the best product for our agency that I can. And that doesn't mean taking shortcuts. We had that, you know, we had that conversation and we, so I'm going to roll back to what you said. So he's got a new dog. He's young, first time handler, you know, first time dog. And I told him, I said, there's going to be times that you get mad and frustrated and then the dog's not performing like he should. And what you do at that point in time is you have to catch yourself and realize that I'm doing more harm than good. We put the dog up, we give him a timeout, 15, 20, 30 minutes, maybe an hour break. We bring him back out, and then we start working it, and if he's, if he's back to where he should in working mode. And it's the same thing with people. Um, you know, we get aggravated. I, I read a quote the other day that falls into to the, to what we're going to talk about today. It says, um, and I'm not going to give it verbatim because I don't remember it that way, but basically it said that, the way that people treat you has more to do with them than it does yourself. And a lot of times, especially being in 
you know, where I'm at with my job is there's always an underlying issue that's going on that's causing people to act the way they do. Um, I have learned very, very quickly being in a supervisor role that when my guys come to work and there's something off, it's usually a home issue. And I have mm-hmm. to pick up on that and say, hey, man, is you know, is this a date? Do you need to take off today and clear your mind? Because if you're not in the right frame of mind on what I do, you can get some, yourself or somebody else hurt. And I would rather them to be mm-hmm. able to be in a clear mind and, and, and focus on what their job is and what they're doing. And the same thing goes with, with canine training. We like those dogs to be in a clear head. Um, we've talked about it a lot on this podcast. But... <clears throat> That's the same thing. And when we get aggravated and frustrated, frustrated, and um, there's a book that, that I had to read for one of my, my leadership classes that I took was called Emotional IQ. And that book shed light on so much of my emotional responses um, and triggers. Now I kind of identify what triggers me <laughs> and I know what triggers me. And, you know, let's the, the one example is, you know, for me, when my neck starts getting hot, my ears start getting red, then I'm getting ready to get mad. It's going to it's going to happen. Like, that's what that's what's going on. Yeah. That. And if we're yeah. able to catch those things and realize what state we're in, it helps us deal with people better. And I think that's where we're yeah. going with this. Well, why is it why is it so difficult? Uh, Paul, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to ask you this question because you you as a pastor and the organizations you belong to and, you know, you see people problems every day. Uh, sure. And why is it so hard for people to do a self evaluation and, and look, look at themselves and, and I'll give you an example. Uh, we talked started talking about how, you know, your personal, emotions can translate into your dog training. There have been several times where um, I've left the house to go hunting and I didn't leave in the best of terms. <laughs> I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> you know, it was one of those All deals where there. Like, you're going hunting. And, and, my wa- and my wife never, hardly ever gives me any problems with hunting. It's always something else. She'll always talk about something else because I'm hunting so much that she won't say don't hunt she'll bring up when are you going to fix this or when are you going to do that type thing yeah and and when i've gone out there and i've been upset or mad and i go hunting and then the dog starts doing stuff yeah. man i get i even get madder i get i get more upset and more mad and then it's just like yeah. this isn't and doing any good and you're not really even mad at the dog right no not you're, at all and you may not even really be mad at your wife, to be honest. You may be mad at yourself because oh, if you're a, a, a well, I mean, if you're a person <laughs> that has a halfway brain, you're like, okay, well, maybe she is right. And I've been fortunate; my wife has never given me a. She's never told me I couldn't go hunting or whatever, or go to a coon hunt. So uh, I'm with you, but it's like, yeah, but when are you gonna? Now that my my kids are older, I've got two boys. Uh, it's like when you gonna spend time with the kids? Well, now you know. We've been coon hunting every night, you know, since the season came in, which is only three nights ago, but still, like, uh, but yeah, so you, you see that, hey, what she's saying is right. Um, you know, I, I am neglecting some other things, and really it comes back to yourself. But to come back to your, your original point, your original question, why is it so hard to self-evaluate? And I, I really wish I knew the answer, but this is an age-old problem. Um, we can... As, as humans, as people, we are very good at identifying problems in other people. Um, and I, if you want to I go into the dog world. all the time. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> or we're very good at evaluating even the problems that other people's dogs have, right? And, <laughs> and you know, uh, but we don't want to admit the problems that we have. And uh, so it's the whole, it goes back to the, you know, you you know, you see the splinter in someone else's eye, but you don't see the log sticking out of yours, right? And uh, it, it's so <laughs> difficult to step back and say, okay, let's let's forget about this person, let's forget about my wife or kids for a moment, um, not in a bad way, but what am I? What do I need to work on? What are the problems that I'm dealing with? And that uh, it takes a lot of humility. Um, it you know, you really got to just 
suck it up and do it because it's not a pleasant thing to do. Um, but it's a tough thing, and it's something we all struggle with to look at our own lives and say, okay, what am I doing that is wrong? What are the emotional responses I'm putting out there? And back to Heath's point about emotions and, and seeing those things that trigger you, um, I was reading a book not too long ago called The Science of the Christian Life, and really just dealt with a lot of principles that would help people in whatever walk of life you're in. And the author said, when you allow someone to control your emotions, you're allowing them to control you. That's right. And yeah. we don't want to be controlled, right? We're, especially as Americans, we're independent, right? We, uh, we, uh, you know, our forefathers came here so they could have freedom. We don't want someone to control us. But when we let that guy uh, mess with us and mess with our emotions and we make an emotional response, whatever field we're in, whatever area we're working in at that time, we're essentially allowing that person to dictate what our life is going to be like for the next few moments, hours, or days. And um, that's something we've got to work on, but it's definitely a big part of it is looking at ourselves and saying, okay, where can I improve? What can I do better? Well, I, I'm going to go back to, to how why is it so hard? It takes a certain level of maturity is one. Um, it took me Absolutely. a long time to get that. And the second thing is um, nobody wants to speak about their faults or their weaknesses. And the only way that you're going to mm-hmm. develop personally or grow personally is to identify those. And that goes back to the maturity level. I mean, okay, I want to be better at X, Y, and Z for A, B, and C reason. And then you have to, to look in the mirror and take a hard look at it and evaluate yourself as honest as you can. Um, and I think that's hard for anybody. Um, it's still hard for me to say, like, I can tell you all of my weaknesses. Um, and some of them, some of them are, are little things and some of them are big things. But, you know, it took me a long time to Let's get to that point with. where I was comfortable and was – had enough um, humility to say, okay, you know, there's, there's, we talked about the no perfect dog and this is the same thing with humans. There's no perfect human. And, you know, we have to, um, you've got to want to do that for yourself. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Well, Paul, one of the, one of the things that I've seen, you know, and I've been guilty of this myself, I'm speaking from experience here and I always, you know, uh, I'm just, a beggar, beggar trying to find it, help other beggars where to find bread here this is all I'm doing because I've seen this in myself. You know, you, you, you're rolling down the road and you're going to hunt in this spot and pull up there and somebody else is hunting in your spot mm. and you jump out and you're mad or they say something and then you get mad. So it goes right back to what you said. When we re- react emotionally, we're giving up our control to somebody else control of who we are. Because when I, when I know what can trigger you emotionally, then then I'm in control at that point. I think that's profound. The, yeah. the, but we all do it. We all give up control at some point. I've done yeah, exactly what you're saying. Because we're all emotional. Yeah, I've done exactly what yeah. you're saying, Chris. I, it's been several years ago. I mean, it's been, it's been several years ago. But, yeah, a, a group that hunts hunted a, a whole different area, they never left that area, ever. Um, and we come up into a place we hunt. There was a tree across the road. So we didn't, none of us had a chainsaw. Snow was on. My, my brother-in-law had found a track the day before. So we were going in to, to, to work that track, try to either walk it out or put the dogs on it or whatever. So we had to drive all the way around. It's like a 25 mile drive around. We got up in there Well, that other group had brought a chainsaw, cut the tree and was sitting on the track that we was, we were going after And I did. I jumped out of the truck and, you know, I was not happy. And I'm like, you know, you guys never, ever hunt over here. Never. You don't leave. You hunt the same place every day, year in and year out. Why now? And then, you know, the older guy in the group who I had a really good relationship with, he was like, well, I know, Heath, but, you know, we are not finding anything where we're at. And we just thought we would try over here. So after I calmed down, I'm like, yep, okay, so we... You know, we went on about our business, went hunting somewhere else. But I've done that. I've done that emotional reaction. And looking back on it now, it's not the way to handle things. Cal- Calvin Redhouse, uh, 
when we talked to him for the podcast. We talked about that very thing because it, it was amazing to me. Calvin lives on the Navajo Reservation and um, Navajo Nation out there in, in the northeast corner of Arizona. And it, it, it amazed me that I could just buy a tag and go out there and hunt anywhere I wanted with just, just as an American. And, and I asked him, I was like, Calvin, doesn't that bother, I mean, when you, when you, doesn't that bother you when you head up to the mountain, that's your ancestral tribal land. If anybody's got a right to it, he's got a right to it. I said, you're going up the mountain and you find me sitting on a track or in a place that you wanted to hunt. And Calvin was just real upfront about it. He's like, no, huh. if I get beat to a spot the first day, you better get up early because you're not going to beat me the next day. You know, almost Jocko Willink type stuff. Okay, you're sitting in my, my spot good. Then I need to have more personal discipline to get up earlier to make sure that doesn't happen. I, I that, that spoke volumes to me when Calvin talked about that. Of all the people to say that, you know, here's, here's Calvin on his, on his tribal, ancestral tribal land. And he's like, nah, if you're truck parked there from Indiana, you know, good luck guys, but you're not going to beat me tomorrow. Promise. Now, and he 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 took he he took emotion out of the equation, which is not an easy thing to do. Um, even you know, you guys, uh, your backgrounds, you know, someone that's being emotional tries to elicit an emotional response. And so, you know, I'm mad about something, and and I try to get you to be mad about it too, so then we can both act like morons, right? So, um, <laughs> we we try to elicit that emotional response, and that's. You know that's a whole that's a whole other part we can talk about is um, uh, two two parts of the two sides of the same coin I guess if you will is in controlling your own emotions and and then not reacting emotionally when someone can't control theirs and that's really uh, you know it's, it's my background working with EKC and you guys in law enforcement you know uh, everybody wants to get you there at ten so they want you to be at ten too but you need to stay at too so you can have a reasonable person on the scene and um yeah and so that's what he's talking about. you know he he just took emotion out of the equation hey if you're here good luck to you but uh but i'm going to beat you next time you know and yeah i guess it's a very like you said mature thing to sure the way to look at it yeah well let's talk about how to handle those situations um you know we run into that quite often you know where i'm hunting at there's a lot of um, newer groups, and when I say newer groups, guys that hadn't been hunting, you know, five, six years. And then you have a lot of the, the older groups, you know, that's been hunting 20, 25, 30 years. And there seems to be a lot of bleed over. A lot of people hitting the same same areas and same sections and, you know, hunting. You're, you know, you're constantly, very seldom you're not intertwining with somebody. And some of those people are local. And like we found out during our early season, some of them are not local. They're driving an hour, two hours to hunt. Some of them are driving six or seven. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so how do we how do we That'd be me. how do we have a good relationship? How do we handle that? Um Yeah, thoughts. Well, yeah. you know, um, so this is this is one of the things um, uh, we complain about uh, as coon hunters. I say we very loosely, but um, where I grew up in Southern Illinois, I don't know if it's as big a deal uh, around here, but around Florida, you know, you're you're inundated now with the um, suburban deer deer slayers, um, and so they'll they they buy or lease land. They live in Chicago or St. Louis, and Chicago was you know, six hours away and, but they're driving down there from the city and they don't want anybody to step on their land and, and that they've leased up for deer hunting. And we know as hound hunters, um, you know, that's not making near the impact that they think it is for a hound to go across, across their land. But man, they just get up tight now with the, with the cell phone game cams and stuff where like, man, I can't believe these guys are coming from Chicago. They're coming from, St. Louis or Indianapolis or whatever city is nearest you. I mean, insert your area there. And I can't believe they would have the audacity to come down here and hunt. 
but at the same time, like Joe Blow that lives down the block, if he happens to drop in a place that I wanted to drop tonight, like I'm ready to flash his tires, right? So that's not, <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're we're dealing, with, you know, we we are we're we're um, or uh, you know when somebody comes and tells us about a hunting spot, we want to go there. So we're we're kind of. Um, we're fighting it from both directions almost like, Oh, these deer hunters are claiming everything, but at the same time, we don't want coon hunters hunting the places they know they can hunt. That doesn't make it. I don't know if I'm making sense there, but it's the um, same way with, with bear hunting. And I think it's all scale yeah. because when you go out West, uh, it's nothing like trying to bear hunting out West is nothing like, like bear hunting in the East. You know, when you go to Virginia, it's not unusual to pass, several trucks in the morning, mm -hmm. you know, just meeting uh -huh. them head on, going up and down the same roads that aren't with the group of people that you're hunting with. Out there, um, you know, if you see two or three other hound rigs in all the places that I've hunted, I know there's other places where um, it's not that way, but uh, it's an un it's it's a busy day. If you, if you pass one, you're surprised. If you pass two, it's like, what are all these people doing up here? Trying to bear hunt. And, um, uh, it, the the problem is we all feel it. We all feel the squeeze that we're losing access to property, and that's that. Even even the wildlife managers in this country, that's the number one enemy to hunting. Is where do we hunt? Where are we going to put people to hunt? Because like you said, Paul, you get the you get the deer leasing guys that come in and lock up big tracts of land. There's actual companies out there that are that are leasing this farmland on five year leases. They may only lease it one or two two years out of that five years, but your access has been restricted. Some of the places that I've hunted, um, you know, most of my adult life, I can't enter now because they're they're locked up by a company that does large scale leasing and then lease uh -huh. subleases out to other hunters. So that's that's part of it. So we're automatically we're internalizing all this stuff. It's like, man, I'm getting place to hunt. I'm getting place to hunt. And then when you do go to that spot you want to hunt, and there's another truck park there, then it's like over the top. I mean, it sends you to that ten level that you talked about. It's like you know, I, I wanted to get out here and hunt, and there's already somebody here. So again, it's, it's, I don't know I, what, what is it? What is the answer, you know, to, to avoiding, I, I've spent some time contemplating it, but what do you guys think? I don't know that. Uh, uh, Go ahead, Paul. Cause I'm kind of at a loss too. Well, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of the same place. You know, how do you, uh, we can deal with, with dealing with emotions, but you know, uh, saying you shouldn't get mad and, and uh, hitting your hammer, hitting your thumb with a hammer are two different things, right? It's easy to say, it's hard to live. And same thing with these, you know, hunters that come in there. Uh, you know, part of it, I guess, should be in our mindset, you know, how how fortunate we are to have the places that we do have. But also, I think the answer can, can lie somewhat in, I'm talking about with deer hunters, turkey hunters, those guys leasing up land, uh, a little bit of education from, from people. Hey, this is um this is what we're doing this is you know we're not trying to hurt your deer hunting we're not trying to do this or whatever and it may not do any good but um it, it could build some fences between a, us and a community that uh we're pretty cut off from right now um and but you know as far as getting mad because somebody else is hunting well let's you know you could look at it from two ways i'm well one i'm mad because they're in my spot or two, and yeah, I can't hunt this spot, but I've got a hundred more. Uh, but at least our sport's not dead. At least I'm not the only one that's, that's out here trying to do this and trying to preserve our rights. Um, so I don't know. A different perspective, I think, can make a lot of difference too. I guess what I would like to see is is more houndsmen getting involved getting involved in the process of what you just said, trying to save our lifestyle, save our legacy, instead of looking at it like I've got a coon dog and I'm going to hunt look at it as how can I contribute to preserving this lifestyle so that I can continue to hunt. Uh, because I think we talked, Heath and I talked briefly before, you know, it doesn't matter. We can talk about coon dogs. We can talk about training coon dogs. We can talk about training a lion dog, whatever it is. But if we don't, if we don't all get on the same page and unify under this common banner 
of being a houndsman and what that really means, all we're going to have to do is talk about the dogs of the, the old days because we're not going to be able to hunt. And, and going to war with a fellow houndsman, that's the only friend you got in this hunting community. We can talk about bridging gaps, and we have done that. But at the end of the day, the only friends that a houndsman has is another houndsman. The duck yeah, hunters aren't going to come and save you. The sheep hunters aren't going to come and save you. Elk hunters, deer hunters are not coming to save you. We've got to figure out how to get along within our community. And that's that's one of the things that I was going to say earlier was the fact that as I travel around and I ask people that I feel have actually given some thought to it about what the biggest threat to hound hunting is, a lot of times I hear other houndsmen are the biggest threat to hound hunting because yeah. of the because of the stories about you're hunting in my area you hunt the wrong color dog you're doing this you're doing that and we've got to find a way to come under this common banner and stand together and i think there's some keys to doing that yeah absolutely well it goes back even even further than that um you know uh, every for every guy that that coon hunts that that goes to competition hunts whatever registry you prefer there's you know you know a handful or more guys that don't and some of them just don't have any idea they don't really care about the competition but what is the number one complaint from guys that you have heard chris when you're out oh why don't you why have you never put old you know old blue in the competition hunt he's a nice dog what do they say well i went to one and i, I got know. cheated yeah, yeah i'm not going there a bunch of cheaters yeah, there's a bunch of arguing and all this and stuff. And, and in reality, who knows what really happened? I mean, um, well, I don't, I don't care, care whether you pay an entry fee and or you're carrying a scorecard or if you're just meeting up with some buddies and going hunting. Very rarely is it just a deal where, hey, no matter what happens, we're going to have a good time because you're keeping score in your head. I guarantee it. How many times, yeah. how many coons did your dog tree versus how many? coons did your buddy's dog tree and you you keep that score whether you want to admit it or not yeah that's absolutely true and and you know i think coon hunting in general to my what i see and i it's funny you kind of bring this up but i was talking to a friend of mine uh maybe just a couple months ago about this very thing even um in the you know the last 20 or 25 years that i can remember hunting coon hunting it, it has changed now uh it used to be all the guys at the local coon club would hunt together with some regularity you know you had one guy that was really your hunting buddy that you hunted with probably most of the time but you'd go over here and you'd hunt you know one night with joe and you'd go hunt one night with ed and you'd you know go you know you know bounce around a little bit maybe you'd drive a couple hours and not even just competition hunting. I'm talking about just going out and having a good time, maybe during kill season, killing some coon. And now, by and large, it, it's, um, I don't know why it is, but it's it's really changed where it's me and my dog, maybe my one buddy that I hunt with, and uh, a lot of these guys, we're not hunting dogs together. We're cutting one one way and one the other way. And I understand the reasons for some of that, preparing for competition and you know, wanting your dog to be independent or whatever. But um, in doing that, we have lost what I think, uh, to me, the, one of the greatest strengths of coon hunting. Uh, I have people all the time, especially uh, like preachers and stuff, if I'm at a pastor's meeting, and they'll talk about hunting. Of course, there's a, you know, a lot, a lot of them deer hunt, turkey hunt, that sort of thing. And they say, well, why do you coon hunt? I said, for me, it's two reasons. Number one, the dog. I want to see good dog work. I think we're all in agreement there. We, you know, whether it's a coon hound, a bear dog, rabbit dog, you know, a deer dog, whatever it is that you're hunting with a dog, bird dog, you want to see that dog work. But number two, it's the fellowship of, it. you know, Chris, you and I, we can go out and we can hunt. And yeah, we're walking to trees and we're listening to the dogs, but I'm going to learn more about you and about how you think and about your family and your faith or whatever, I'm going to learn more about you in that hour or two of pleasure hunting than, you know, than I could uh, any other way probably. And those are the mm -hmm. two strengths I think of coon hunting are the dogs, if you're a dog person, and the fellowship with other coon hunters. 
and I think we're we're losing that a little bit in in our country today. Um, guys are just becoming more and more secluded and more and more just getting ready for competition hunts. And I'm I'm for the competition hunts. I love them, but um, it's it's we're we're kind of losing that fellowship. I think with one another. I think that's what drew me to bear hunting so much, especially with Heath. He's got a great group of guys that that uh, he hunts with over there and and uh, having that camaraderie within hunting is what we've been missing i wrote a paper this has been a long time ago 30 years ago now um, for college and it was about conservation organizations and the dynamics of concert conser- even then organizations were starting to struggle for membership and for involvement and personal investment from people. And and so th- this has been a topic for, for decades. And you can only imagine, we haven't improved. We've only gotten worse since then. But after World War II, there's a, there's a specific time period where they call it the golden age of conservation. And it was, it was in the 1950s up to about the mid 60s. It's when, it's when outdoor life saw its highest subscriptions to magazines and uh, your conservation clubs were booming. Your your coon clubs. When we were kids, Paul, I mean, I know you you've seen this, but you go to the local club and um, you better get there earlier. You're going to be walking to the clubhouse because mm-hmm. you you know it, it, the place was packed. And uh, what's happened was, from the studies I've I've seen and I've 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 written about, are the fact that when our World War II veterans came back from World War II. They were deployed for four years, a lot of them, if they lived through it. Um, so they served in these tight communities, and they built these bonds and these fraternal bonds with each other. And when they came back, they still desired that sort of relationship with other like-minded men and people. And so that's where you saw the Elks, the Moose, the Fraternal Order, Order of Eagles, all those organizations were at their, their height. And, and they were all coming together for a common cause. And that's when our coon clubs and different things start. And we've lost that. It's just, it's just been a matter of attrition that we've lost that sort of spirit. And it, I mean, you can point your fingers in a lot of different ways, but, but you know, there's something about that camaraderie that was built and demonstrated for us decades ago that we're losing. Absolutely. And we're, you know, people crave community. Um, you know, that's what a church is as a community. That's what a king club is as a community. Um, and I remember, you know, <laughs> Can I say something kid... real quick. Yeah, oh, absolutely. That up. I got a, I got a funny thought on that once you're done. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, you, I remember as a kid, you know, the, 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 regular Friday, the last Friday night of the month was when Flora has their uh, club meeting and um, you know, they'd always have sandwiches or chili or something and, and then a club hunt wasn't licensed and um, yeah, it would be, you know, packed in there and I'm sure they still have some that are better attended than others depending on the weather, if it's during harvest or whatever. Uh, but you're, you're just really not seeing those numbers. And what has happened? Well, I mean, the, the coon hunters are somewhere. I mean, you look at, you know, look at the world hunt, look at the, uh, the term of the champions, look at super stakes, uh, autumn oaks, winter classic. They're all, it seems like every couple years they're breaking their record for how many entries they've got. Right. In all red, you know, especially in, in all the registries, they're just, the bigger hunts are getting bigger, but the smaller hunts, um, are getting smaller and the club meetings are, almost non-existent they're just people aren't seeing the value in that and and it goes back to okay so now you pull up to where joe blows down there hunting in your spot instead of getting out and dropping your dogs with him now you've made an enemy for life right <laughs> and and it doesn't we're not helping ourselves doing that i call it the domino effect and chris and i talked about this and our group has had this conversation you know we've we've went into an area that we hunt, we hunt, um, you know, I've been hunting 27 years now and I've pretty much hunted the same places. I don't vary a whole lot. And you go into a, to a place and somebody else is there and you look around like, okay, well, let's just go somewhere else. We, we've got decent enough dogs that we should be, go, be able to go about anywhere and catch a bear or two maybe. 
Um, but then what happens is you go to another place and then you're infringing on another group because there's so many groups and it's a domino effect. So you've left that, you've left that, that area to stay out of their hair. But then when you go to another area, you've got in somebody else's hair and just what you're saying, Paul is, you know, you're not making friends that way. Um, especially in the bear hunting community, that stuff doesn't, for whatever reason, and this, you know, this is the topic we're talking about, it doesn't set well. So are you as that group just supposed to say, okay, I'm not going to make anybody mad today. So I'm going to just not hunt. Um, and that's kind of where this is going, especially in the area that I'm in, because there's, there's so many, and I say newcomers because, you know, the core groups that was here 20 years ago, um, there's still, when there weren't any bear. Yeah. When there wasn't any, there was two or three groups. Um, and then those groups got so big that they started splitting in two or three different directions. The, the people started, you know, having qualms or whatever else, like you said, we're our own worst enemy. And then they've got two or three groups and then those groups have busted up again. And then now you've got, and we went from three groups to, I mean, there was five different groups in an area that I hunt and two of the five groups, I've never seen them before. Never. So we want to do the right thing. We want to just, you know, go and do our own thing and stay out of everybody else's hair. But when you do that, you, like I said, you run over into somebody else's space and, you know, so how, how do you bridge that gap? How do you, how do you, um, come out of that with a, a feeling of accomplishment that, okay, this is, you know, we've, we've crossed that bridge. We've, we've, we've made an amends. We've done whatever, however you want to put it. How do you do that? I think I, I obviously spent a lot of time thinking about this as well. And, you know, I'm speaking from an outsider for what goes on in Virginia, of course, and I always will. Um, I'm just speaking totally is a hunting community. I don't care if it's a coon hound or it's a, it's a bear dog. We've got to, we've got to appreciate the fact that the fact that our numbers are growing is a good mm. thing. It's a mm -hmm. good thing. You know, when you get right down to the nuts and bolts of the whole thing, it is good that people are getting involved. So the other, the other thing I think is we have to look at it as a personal challenge. Are we, are we really not able to hunt or are we just not able to hunt in the ways we want to? Do we want to ride the roads and rig a bear and, you know, have the bear rig and be cool and have the rig dog? Or are we willing to get out there and, and bust the brush and get in the country where the bears are and, and catch those, those hard to catch bears? And, I think those are all questions that we have to ask ourselves and you know going back to what paul says about being community yeah we all are community driven that's why when john wick came out with that brown canvas coat to be a real coon hunter you had to have one you know because you wanted to look like everybody else it you know the diamond plate dog boxes i remember when they all came out man if you're going to make it if you're really going to be the guy you're going to wear a john wick coat and you're going to have that aluminum diamond plate box and, and i played that game too i remember when i first got first got my first pair of coveralls and a pair of green uh hip waders that said coon hunter nightlight sold them i thought man i have arrived i'm there but i'm an individual i'm, I'm my own man i'm my own person you know but i want to look like everybody else i want to go so, i want to go back to what you said about um our sport is growing but mm -hmm. How many of those individuals are taking, and we've talked about this before, <clears throat> how many of those individuals are joining these associations and coming to meetings and replying to the, the DWR to make our sport better? I don't see that growth like it should be with the amount of hunters we are seeing. Um, and mm -hmm. I think that's somewhere that we could all do better. I um, mean, like I said, I've said it before, you know, it's something I've got to be more cognizant about and self-aware about is joining this stuff and having a voice. Well, I would ask, I would ask how many of those new bear hunters that you've met on the mountain have you asked if they're a member of the Virginia Bear Hunters Association or Sportsman's Alliance or 
or any of these groups? How many of how many of you tried to recruit to be a part of that? And I, I only ask you that not to put you on the spot, but I think that's a key ingredient. Is these new hunters are looking for guidance, they're looking for people to help them and and answer their questions and point them in the right direction so they can be more successful. And as a person who's been hunting for 40 years, like I have, um, I ought to be a little more helpful to, to these new people that are looking for some of these answers, not do things for them. I don't believe in that, you know, teach a man to fish and you feed him for a lifetime is what I, you know, if you give him a fish, you feed him for a day. If you teach him to fish, you feed him for a lifetime. That's a philosophy I, I live by, but, um, uh, um, uh, I think it's incumbent upon us, the veterans, to be the stewards and the caretakers of what we've got and um, helping these new people find their way on the journey. Yeah, and I, I, yeah. I haven't been outside of our group, honestly. You know, we talk about it within our group. Um, we had several join this year, but outside of the group, I've never had that conversation with them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, I, I, and that, that goes for whatever organization you're talking about. You know, I talk about a church. You can complain about it dying, but if you're not going to go out and do anything to bring some life, what what's going to happen? I think um, I just remembered uh, when Chris was talking about uh, going around and asking people if they're part of the different associations. Um, I don't know if you know Philip uh, Heron, Luke Heron down in Arkansas, black and tan guy, and uh, I think it was, you know, he's sells black and tan pups and whenever he sells one or gives one to a kid he always gives them a pup and a one-year membership to the american black and tan Coonhound association <clears throat> and i don't know for sure how many people have have stayed on to be members but i know it's been at least a few and um uh, does he have to do that that's money from his own pocket no but uh he's been a very successful promoter of the black and tan breed and the black and tan association because he's willing to take into his own pocket and put his money where his mouth is, you know, and, and say, Hey, let's work together for the betterment of this particular thing. And so whether you're talking about bear hunters or coon hunters or conservation or whatever, uh, who are we drawing in? Who are we inviting into our little group? Um, uh, you know, I've been in some of those clubs. Uh, I've, I've been all over the country. Uh, different places, uh, both with UKC and just uh, when I left UKC, I went into the ministry. And man, you walk into a into a pen club somewhere, and it's not like you're you're not wearing a name tag or anything. And and who cares who Paul Frederick is anyway? But you walk in there, and it's and it's like you know, I, I would have been less of a distraction if I had horns and one eye than just a newcomer coming into the pen club. <laughs> What's he know. doing here? Yeah, who is yeah. that? What's this guy doing? It was Joe's turn to win this. I hope he's not packing a do coon dog because <clears throat> it was Joe's turn to win this month. Yeah, exactly. And, <laughs> and they, uh, you know, and I, I remember I was in uh, Knoxville, Tennessee, and I was in college, and I went to a coon club there in Maynardville. Those, you know, they who's this guy? And of course, they could tell right away that I'm not from East Tennessee, and. Um, you know, you don't know. Somebody says they coon hunt or somebody says they bear hunt. Oh, well, anybody could say that, but they really know what they're talking about. I went out and spectated on a cast. By the time the cast was over, you know, we were, you know, we were all great friends and we had a great time. But, um, uh, you know, what's wrong with reaching out to somebody that's, that's showing some interest in the sport and trying to teach them something, you know? Well, I think with me that gets into a whole nother topic um that that a lot of us hunters have run into that um and i you know i'll just go ahead and say it you know you you take this this newcomer in and you show them the ropes and you show them how to hunt you get them dogs lined out you take them in your places and in two years from now they're in there in front of you with their friends hunting hunting the same places where you showed them that it took you 15 years to figure out how to hunt it and how the game moved and you know where to find the animals at and then they took 20 years of your knowledge in two years and just said oh i've got it now and then they jump in front of you and i think that's another huge issue that we deal with in the hunting community um 
So, and I mean, we've had that happen. I mean, I've had it happen numerous times to me over the last 10 years. You know, just I mm-hmm. won't even go back 27. I'll just go 10 years. Um, in fact, yeah. I had a group that I hunted with at one point in time. Basically, they told me that, you know, you're, you're going to hunt with us, but I better not catch you back in here when you're not with us. And I mean, I was a kid then. I was like, oh, okay. You know, <laughs> you know, I was like, and I, to this day, I don't go in there unless I'm going to get my dogs. And if my dogs are in there, they've come from two mountains over, you know, I, I try to respect, yeah. um, you know, I, I, I just try to be respectful. I guess that's the word that There's I would some use. Of, some of those lessons, some of those lessons, when you learn them early <laughs> enough and you learn them the right way, they stick with you for the rest of your life. You know, and, yeah. and not everybody has the same upbringing and and uh, background and things like that these days. Even I don't care. It's not a Mason Dixon line thing. I've, you know, it, it it applies everywhere, east, west, north, and south. Um, you know, just the overall respect that people show each other in today's society seems to be a lot less. And uh, I don't think that our social media platforms have helped that at all because it's too easy to snipe people from a keyboard and uh, Mm -hmm. and you do that enough and then you become emboldened and you think you can do it out on the side of a mountain somewhere and then you can't figure out why some good old boys got you by the shirt collars and threatening to throw the life out of you and it's like you're not on facebook anymore (laughs) (laughs) one of my favorite quotes of all time is from mike tyson and you've probably heard it. He said, everyone has a plan until you get punched in the face. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and that's, and that's the way it is with personal growth stuff, too, man. I'm telling you. You can absolutely. sit back in situations like this and pontificate and talk about all the good things. But when you're faced with it and you're in the middle of it, you can fail. I mean, you will absolutely. just get I, – I tell, I'll tell this story again on myself. We were bear hunting in West Virginia. And um, – I'd already been producing podcasts and talking about how we need to get together and unify and all this rainbow and lollipop stuff. And uh, the dogs were getting out onto the highway and I was on the highway and I was gathering up dogs. I mean, I was scrambling, trying to pick dogs up and I couldn't catch a dog and traffic was flying. And so all of that was piling up on me. And then this lady pulls up and she goes, she stops her van and she says, Hey, can I talk to you a minute? And I just looked at her and I snapped. I was like, what do you need? This is not a good time. You know, just, and she was like, well, she goes down the road. Well, I come to find out she's the landowner where my dogs just crossed and she tolerates bear hunters every day. And she wanted, she was stopping to see where she could go or what dogs we were looking for, how she could help. And in the heat of the moment, you know, like you said, everybody's got to play until they get punched in the face. And I was getting emotionally punched in the face right then, and I failed the test. It happens. Mm-hmm. And and really, the the whole uh, the whole point of this conversation, I think, uh, for is a conversation we've had so far. It, it really, to me, and this may be an oversimplification, but it comes back to pride and our pride, uh, just like Heath was talking about these guys go out they learn from him and in two years they've got their own group now i don't know all of Heath's background but at some point you know after maybe 15 years you started your own group um so why shouldn't they be able to start their own group well because it kind of hurts your pride that they can do it without you and somebody's in your hunting spot that you don't own you really have no right to other than uh the guy allows you to hunt um it's a matter of pride. Hey, this is where I hunt. You can't be here. When you're trying to look at yourself and say, how can I be better? We don't want to do that because we are too prideful and, and we, we think too highly of ourselves. And, and, um, it, it, you know, our emotions get in there and somebody hurts our pride and it, it does something that, that and we don't like. Um, man, we just we, we react so poorly to that. But it all comes back to a matter of, of wounded pride, a matter of wounding what we think we deserve, right? What uh, that, oh, They can't do this to me. I can't believe they'd want to do this to me. And, um, and, and that's one of the most difficult emotions, one of the most difficult things to deal with 
is is our pride, what we think we deserve, right? I I can even relate that to parenting. You know, with grown kids now, you know, their whole lives hmm. they were growing up. It's like make your decision. I'm training you to be able to make your own decisions. You know, I want you to do, and then they make a decision, and it's the wrong decision, <laughs> and then I blow up instead of saying. Oh, you had the courage to make a decision on your own. You, you made it wasn't a good decision, but you had the courage to make the decision. And, and I'm not talking about, you know, don't do drugs and now you're doing drugs type stuff. I'm talking about, you know, just giving them freedom to make simple life choices, and and, boom, they make it, and then you proceed to tell them how stupid they are for making that decision. That's that's talk about bad parenting 101. That one's. I've got the, I've got the market corner on that, um, you know, and it's the same way with these young, young hunters that that are trying to get into this thing. They want to make a name for themselves. They, maybe they don't want to be recognized as being in Chris's group or Heath's group or, or you know, the guy that hunts dogs for, whoever. So they get their own dog and they go out and they 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 start campaigning their own dog. And they're trying to make a name for themselves. Sometimes we just got to let them make mistakes on their own and and uh, applaud them for having the courage to try by themselves. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a, I mean, that's a, a deep topic. Um, like I said, I we don't own national forest. I mean, we're, of course, coon hunting here is a little different. I mean, you know, we hunt national forest, and you don't own you don't own a, a rock on it. And if somebody else is there, then that's that's where they can go hunt. You have no control over it. The only thing you have control over is your attitude and your emotions and how we handle it. Um, and that goes back to how we started this conversation is, um, you know, personal growth and how you handle situations, how you make yourself better um, for that interaction within itself or if, if you just avoid the interaction and go on and go somewhere else. But... So I think it's um, like I said, I think it's something we all deal with at some point in time. I don't care what you, what game you're hunting. I mean, like you said, the deer hunters, the turkey hunters. Um, you know, last turkey season was awful for me. Um, some of the places I hunt on national forest, every place that I'd hunted for years had vehicles in it, and most of them were out of state vehicles. They weren't even from here. And that was a that was that was a uh, national trend during COVID, COVID mm-hmm. was turkey license were up 33%. So mm-hmm. it's a cons- COVID was a conspiracy to uh, interfere with Heath's hunting. Yes, it was. And fishing. <laughs> it hurt my trout fishing yeah. too. Lord have mercy. You couldn't beat people out of your favorite hole. <laughs> F- fishing license were the same way. You know, that's one thing, going back to something earlier in the conversation, kind of talking anecdotally now um, about the problem. You know, around here, it's all private property. And we got to face it, when you're hunting a hound, it takes a lot of property. There's no way that you can own all the property that you need to to hunt. Most people can't anyway. There's a few people out there that could, but it's not me. And it's not most of the coon hunters that I know or the bear hunters I know. So right off the bat, if I'm driving down the road and somebody's parked on Alford's property up here, I just got to face the fact that I don't own that. And that's not my spot. That's a spot that I'm allowed to hunt. And if somebody else has got permission to hunt there too, then I've got to be, I've got to be considerate of that and cognizant of that. I don't have to like it. And I, I always drive past thinking, man, I thought I had that place to myself, but if you got a good enough dog, you're still going to go in there and treat coons behind, you know, the next night or the, the day after they're not going to kill them all. Um, and then on the on the national forest deal again it's just one of those deals where we have to accept the fact that the first tenant of the wildlife north american wildlife uh, model for conservation is wildlife shall be head, held in a public trust which means that truck that's parked there could be a berry picker it could be a hiker it could be whatever and um so we have to we have to look at it from that standpoint and be be tolerant we're not i'm not saying you have to be a, a doormat and let everybody wipe their feet on you but if you don't own it you don't own it and you just uh-huh. gotta you gotta figure out you gotta expand your game and figure out how to be successful in spite of the interferences 
everybody can catch the easy one. Everybody, anybody can catch the one that's, you know, that's standing on the side of the road begging to be caught. But the best hunters I know always find ways to be successful. Well, I think, you know, I, yeah. I would challenge everybody to be Calvin Redhouse because I actually done that, well, you know, last year. Um, I was getting up two hours early and driving an hour. And that's what I say. If you go beat me in here, you better pack a lunch because <laughs> that's where I'm yeah. going. <laughs> and that's what we did. So I challenge people to be the, the Calvin, you know, you know, smile about it and go on today and do better tomorrow. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's, it's all like Chris said earlier, matter of perspective in that too. Would you rather um, nobody were in your hunting spots, but then there were no coon, there were no bear, there was nobody else holding your hand against the antis, or would you rather that you get inconvenienced once in a while, knowing that there are other people out there enjoying the sport who, when push comes to shove, they're going to vote the right way to allow us to keep and to me it's worth being inconvenienced once in a while um that's a good point you know um just how you look at it well that's a good perspective honestly one thing that keeps coming to mind for me is uh bill westfall was he he's uh he was one of the lead, he was the lead instructor for the indiana indiana, uh, indiana law enforcement leadership academy and uh, Bill starts his thing out. He's like, you know, he's standing in a group of, of 50 law enforcement supervisors. He just tells them up front. He's like, not all of you are going to take in what I'm telling you. You know, not all of you are going to, this is not all going to sink in. Some of you are going to think I'm full of crap. Some of you are going to go back and say that's the biggest waste of time. He goes, I only need 10 of you. I only need 10 of you to leave here. And with that number, we can start changing. If I get 10. Just give me 10 from each group. We can start changing this thing. And I know this podcast is going to be the same way. They're going to be like, oh, they were talking about personal growth. And, you know, the prideful individual is never going to admit that he has a problem or that there is a problem. But if we can get 10, if we can get 10%, if we can, if we, if we can start provoking some thought and, and people maybe stepping back and thinking, how could I handle this situation better? How could I be somebody that other people want to be around instead of always being the person that's got the drama and the and the turmoil around them nobody wants to hang <clears> with <throat> those people you know they want to uh -huh. be with the positive people that find you know they, they want to explore new ideas they don't want to talk about problems all the time you know they want to explore new ideas that's that's the that's a sign of higher thinking and and somebody's really looking at how to uh enjoy the journey not just the destination well it's all about surround yourself with good people and it's like michael waddell said you know you want you want those people to be around you because it's going to make you strive to be better yourself and that was the gist of what he said and like i said i caught that um you know i I'm, i love to read and the leadership stuff is some, a, a path that i've went down you know with my career my college education and you know, when some people say as little tidbits of wisdom, because that's what that was, you know, you want to take it in and you want to you want to put that in your toolbox and help it help it make you better. One, you know, we keep talking about leadership and I think we we need to. Um, I, I John Maxwell is a well written person he's written several books about leadership and before anybody kicks this off to the side and say well i don't have any desire to be a leader you know i just want to go out and hunt i don't care about leading a group or leading a club or doing any of this stuff this is what john maxwell says even the most introverted person has influence in approximately twenty-three thousand people in their lifetime whether it's standing in a line at a grocery store whether it's you know interacting with a person that's taking your money you know, and as us, the way I translate that over to us as hunters is uh, if, if I'm hunting with your group, Heath, then I have the, the obligation to represent your group in a way that is honorable. So if somebody's parked in one of our spots, 
at that point, I am the leader for your group. And I approach that person, I'm the leader of your group at that point. You know, because they're just going to recognize me with the, the tan truck and the white Toyota and, and the silver t tundra on the mountain because I hunt with you guys. Mm -hmm. So we all have that opportunity to be a leader and we have to act accordingly because that's the responsibility that's put on us, whether it's you're a member of the Florida Coon Club or you're a member of this hunting group or you're just a hunter in general. We carry that burden of representing hunting and hunters when we buy that license and we go to the field every time. Nobody ever recognizes who the person is with the orange hat walking through the backfield or, or the two guys in a truck rutting up the farmer's field. They just, they just recognize them as hunters, and we have that obligation to represent hunting in a way that, that is honorable and something that needs to be sustained in our society. Yeah, I think it's an individual responsibility to, no matter what sport or hunting um, game that you are, to represent yourself and the hunters in a positive light. And we've said that on here numerous times, that it's, it's an individual responsibility. Yep, the way your dogs are treated, the way your dogs are cared for, you know, all of it. It's all, it's all a, it's, nobody has a right to be a jackass. <laughs> nobody, you know, <laughs> we've got an obligation to do better. And if that means taking a look, if you can't figure out why you can't get along with anybody in, else in the world besides your dog, you might want to take a little time to do some self-reflection. I need to write that on my tailgate. Not everybody else is I'm right. going to write it on my tailgate, don't be <laughs> Don't be a don't be a stubborn <laughs> mule. <laughs> That's a new bumper sticker. Yeah, yeah. Can we um? Yeah. Can we uh, patent that, Chris? <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, Heath. Heath, I'm going to turn it over to you, man. Well, I mean, any final thoughts? I mean. Paul, anything to leave us with? Any tidbits of wisdom and knowledge that we can take with us? Man, I wish I had some. I don't. Maybe I've got a little somewhere, but uh, no. I think there's been a lot of good, good uh, topics brought up from everything from self evaluation to to how we treat our fellow hunters and 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 one another. Um, none of us have arrived. No person's perfect. If we were, we wouldn't have to have this conversation, right? So, uh, I think we can all do better. I think, and I and I hope, like Chris said, I hope there's ten ten out there that decide that they're, you know, what I am an ambassador for this sport, mm -hmm. whatever sport it is that you're that you're involved in. Hey, I am an ambassador for this. I need to do better. I need to control my emotions and not let others control me. And um, you know, if just a few people would take that serious. I think. Like you said, we could make a, a big impact on on hunting in general and on our society as well. Well, I kind of I came into this thing loaded for bear. You know, it's something that I think about a lot. And uh, just as Paul pointed out, it's real easy for us to to find faults in other people and talk about their faults. Um, and I'm real. I've got a PhD in that. And uh, but I do spend a lot of time thinking about the overall good and what we're like really trying to accomplish. Um, and um, I think it just translate into how we portray ourselves in every aspect of this lifestyle that we all love, that we all enjoy. Um, and I think we've got an obligation to uh, represent the body as a whole rather than us as individuals do we want to be recognized by our peers yes that's natural we want to be recognized as someone who has accomplished and things like that but don't let your own personal recognition override what is good for the community as a whole you know make every effort to um, to represent our community in a way that that is beneficial not only to you but to all of us because nobody can stand through this thing alone. Yeah. And I guess I'll leave it at this. I challenge everybody to be the Calvin Red House, um, including myself. And I'm going to do better and take it upon myself to um, encourage and, and, and invite people into organizations and 
to be an ambassador for especially the bear hunters because that's what affects me the most um i do turkey hunt and deer hunt um, and i fish a lot and i'm a i'm a member of several fishing organizations because i, I love to do that so i'm going to do better as far as these other groups when i have a chance to talk to them or i get to pass them on the road and and say hey how you doing you know can i help you with your dogs because i always do that or try to do that um i'm going to have that that conversation with them you know are you a member of, of an organization are you reaching out to the D, dwr and making a comment about our seasons and stuff so you know if, if you guys are listening and you listen to the end of this you know that's something that um you know i encourage you to do and i want everyone to be an ambassador a good ambassador of the sport that you represent because it affects us all. <clears throat> yep. Well, I would tell you this is going to be the, the infomercial part of it, but Houndsman XP is very serious about this. That's been the driving theme behind this show about building unity and saving, preserving, not only saving and preserving, but going on the offense and, and growing our influence in the hunting community. And, um, uh, I'm really proud of, of the uh, partnership we've developed with Sportsman's Alliance. And when people join us on Patreon to support this show and be the voice for that unity and, and you know, more than just telling hunting stories and things like that and telling somebody, we're, we're here to, we're in it to win it. And our partnership with Sportsman's Alliance, I think, is, should be a no-brainer for people. And it's an easy way to... Uh, just drive your stake in the ground and say, hey, this is where we're going to make our stand. Uh, Sportsman's Alliance has a great track record of representing houndsmen, and it's an honor that they considered to have us come on board with them and try to bring more houndsmen into the community. All right. Chris, thanks for um, hosting, and Paul, thank you for taking time out of your day to come and spend with us and, and, and share some of your thoughts with us. Um, it's always good to get an outside perspective um on what we're doing <clears throat> so thank both of you outside he's an insider man yeah he's on the outside <laughs> of this first time on the podcast but paul you've been in a leadership position for a lot of your life and i appreciate your work I well really thank appreciate you i appreciate you too. yeah i appreciate you guys inviting me I had a good time so. all right guys until the next time on the journey start improving yourself and thanks for helping us teach train and learn <laughs>